It's arguably a sad fact of our popular culture that millions of people across the globe know Psycho very well. That is, they know the film Psycho, directed by the master of suspense, Alfred Hitchcock. Not as many are familiar with Robert Block and the novel that bore the name before the movie and inspired its conception. Block wrote hundreds of short stories and over 20 novels, usually crime fiction, science fiction, and perhaps most influentially, horror fiction. He had a legendary gallows sense of humor, one which easily translated into his work. One of his colleagues once told a story about how he and Block were in an elevator and realizing that there were normal people present, launched into a totally deadpan, ghoulish conversation on household methods for disposing of corpses. Later in his career, he would be the recipient of the Hugo Award, the Bram Stoker Award, and the World Fantasy Award. He also served a term as president of the Mystery Writers of America. Welcome to House of Words, a podcast about writers, words, and how we all go a little mad sometimes. This is our exploration into Robert Block's groundbreaking novel, Psycho. Despite my ghoulish reputation, I really have the heart of a small boy. I keep it in a jar on my desk." End quote. Robert Albert Block was born on April 5, 1917 in Chicago, Illinois, the son of Raphael Ray Block, a bank cashier, and his wife Stella Loeb, a social worker, both of German-Jewish descent. During the 1930s, in his formative teenage years, Robert was an avid reader of the pulp magazine Weird Tales. H.P. Lovecraft, a frequent contributor to that magazine, became one of his favorite writers. He befriended and corresponded with Lovecraft, who gave the promising youngster advice on his own fiction writing efforts. His first professional sales at the young age of 17 were to weird tales with the short stories The Feast in the Abbey and The Secret in the Tomb. His early stories were strongly influenced by Lovecraft, and a number of the stories were set in and extended the world of Lovecraft's Cthulhu mythos. It was Bloch who invented, for instance, the oft-cited mythos text de Vermes Mysteries and Culte de Goul. If you're interested in learning more about H.P. Lovecraft, feel free to check out episode 23 where we explore one of the most turbulent and productive periods of his life. In tribute to his young disciple, Lovecraft paid incomparable homage to the teenager by writing him into the text of his novel, The Haunter of the Dark, as Robert Blake. After Lovecraft's untimely death in 1937, Block continued to write for Weird Tales, as well as the science fiction-themed Amazing Stories magazine, quickly becoming one of the most widely read and popular authors of the genre. Most, if not all, of Block's stories involve damaged people. They are misfits living beneath societal radar, outcasts from the mainstream, living lives of quiet desperation. Some are overweight and slovenly. Others are isolated and lonely. They are abandoned by the world, left to find solace and unsavory redemption. There is little tolerance for the unattractive or unintelligent in the world of uniformity, and so these discarded souls must reach out in directions normally shunned by polite society. And his private persona, Robert was a gentle soul with a huge heart who delighted in regaling audiences and friends with jokes. A Mr. Hyde to the softer reflection of his Dr. Jekyll, he rarely shared his darker inspiration with his adored and adoring wife. In his introduction to the paperback anthology, Yours Truly, Jack the Ripper, he writes, My life as Jekyll has been commonplace in the extreme. I have a home, a family, a regular occupation, friends, a normal schedule of hobbies and amusements. Yet, Mr. Hyde is active, nonetheless. It is a partnership which has proved both pleasant and profitable, 
and it would ingratitude indeed if I allowed Dr. Jekyll to take the credit without proper acknowledgement to his alter ego. But the inspiration comes from Mr. Hyde. I fear, however, that Mr. Hyde must also share the blame for errors of taste and judgment. In his haste to effect some particular ghastly revelation, he has ignored many literary niceties. I can only submit that this is a matter beyond my control. In 1945, Block was asked to write exclusively for a new syndicated radio program called Stay Tuned for Terror. Broadcast and produced from Chicago, the series presented a full season of 39 episodes showcasing the work of the author, which he adapted for air from his own short stories. In addition to writing for print and for radio, he held down regular weekly employment as a copywriter for the Gustav Marx Advertising Agency. Although maintaining a respectable income and a reputation during the 40s and 50s and winning the coveted Hugo for his short story that held bound train, he continued to reside in the Midwest and worked in an advertising position in order to remain economically afloat. That would all change, however, in 1959 when he published his new novel, The Story of a Boy, His Mother, and a Motel. Quote, so I had this problem, work or starve, so I thought I had combined the two and decided to become a writer. End quote. Cycle was published on April 10, 1959, as Robert Block's seventh published novel. Being well versed within writing by then, it took him only six weeks to write. The piece, which would be linked with the real life exploits of notorious Wisconsin murderer Ed Gein, would change his life forever. According to a 1985 interview, the author was living only 29 miles from Plainfield, Wisconsin, when the infamous Ed Gein's crimes were discovered. In case you aren't familiar with the story of Ed Gein, here is a short, although bone-chilling summary. Ed Gein came from a line of tragedy as his father, George Philip Gein, experienced being left an orphan after his whole family was killed in a flash flood. George would grow up to become a frequently violent alcoholic. Ed's mother was little better. Augusta Gein was a domineering and ultra-religious fire and brimstone sprouting figure who exerted considerable influence upon her sons. Ed's brother Henry would end up dying in a suspicious fire at the family farm in May 1944. His death was quite likely attributed, at least in part, to Ed. Augusta Gain died of a second stroke not long after this in December of 1945. Ed had lost the only person he had left in his life, and his future from then on would be a torturous one. Twelve years later, Ed was apprehended by police on November 16, 1957 in the small town of Plainfield after suspicions that he was involved in the disappearance of a local store owner, Bernice Worden, which led to a full-scale investigation and search of his home located on a small farm. Worden's body, decapitated and gutted like a deer, was merely the beginning of the awful discoveries the police made that day at the Gain homestead. Gein was responsible for multiple unspeakable crimes, including the murders of at least two victims, grave robbing, mutilation of corpses, and trophy keeping, which included using the skin and body parts of several of his victims to fashion household implements such as lampshades and a garbage container made out of human skin, as well as several human skulls with the top sawn off, among many other grotesque findings. Although Block didn't know much about Ed Gein, Psycho had a similar backstory. That is, it's about a man who lives all his life on a small community and outwardly appears normal but hidden from view. His secret, like Gein's, is that he is brewing a madness in his mind that would eventually be uncontained. When Block discovered how closely the imaginary character he'd created resembled the real Ed Gein both in overt act and apparent motivation, he decided to base his story on the situation rather than on any person, living or dead, involved in the Gein affair. He knew very little of the details concerning the case and virtually nothing about Gein himself at the time, 
which is for this reason why Psycho is not a blow-by-blow retelling of the more gruesome details of the Gein case. Instead, he uses the idea of a quiet rural recluse who is also a psychotic murderer and who happens to share a few attributes with the famous Wisconsin murderer. In an interview, Block would elaborate on his conception of such a man. The man next door may be a monster, unsuspected even in the gossip-ridden microcosm of small-town life. In order to become a successful serial murderer in a close-knit rural society, a man must adopt a reclusive existence. Operating a motel on the outskirts of town seemed a solution. Then, in a November 1985 interview in horror culture magazine Fangoria, he attributes its psycho's long-term impact and ability to frighten to the distressing notion that perhaps a boy's best friend may not necessarily be his mother, and the overall message that we may not always know our neighbors as well as we think we do. The most commonplace people in commonplace surroundings can sometimes offer unexpected menace. The title of the book refers to its psychosexually maladjusted protagonist. Block makes it clear from the first chapter onward that the origin of Bates' sexual psychosis stems from his love hate relationship with his mother. Though his mother is long deceased, Bates keeps her alive in his mind and keeps her body crudely preserved through taxidermy in the cellar of his house. Whenever sexually aroused by a woman, Bates' inner mother takes over his personality and leads him to kill the women, causing the conflict within his diseased mind. Through this character, Block relocates the external marauding monsters of early to mid-20th century American horror fiction. The vampires, the werewolves, the reanimated corpses, and the mad scientists who created them into the interior psychological landscape of middle-class Americans. According to Block, the true origins of Norman Bates can be traced back to his choice of name for his protagonist and even the very title of the novel. None of these choices were haphazard. My title derives, of course, from psychotic and also from psychology and psychoanalysis, Block would say. It was from the latter sources that I sought rationale for my protagonist, or more precisely, an irrationale. So I built a motel and put him in business. But it wasn't until I had arrived at his fixation, accompanied by the transvestism, that was to form his modus operandi, modus vivendi, and my gimmick all in one, that I hit upon his name. Norman Bates. Norman Bates, whose first name of Norman is a pawn based on Bloch's characterization of him as neither woman nor man. His last name is another pawn based on Norman's habit of obsessive masturbation and how he hopes to bait and catch the unwary women who unfortunately find their way to the motel. Like Gein, Norman is so dominated by his mother. In fact, that even after death, he keeps her constant arguing and nagging alive in his mind. In the public mind, the slender young actor Anthony Perkins in Hitchcock's film adaptation will forever be associated with the name of Norman Bates. But Block's original depiction of the character is a 40-year-old plump man given to excessive drinking and book reading, usually about grisly subjects, in between imaginary arguments with his dead mother. The literate Bates in Bloch's book is even aware of the Freudian Oedipal theory and attempts to explain it to his mother with predictably disastrous results. Psycho was not his first foray into the realms of crime fiction, psychological horror, or psychological suspense. Earlier novels such as The Scarf, Spiderweb, and The Will to Kill were all concerned with the doings of the criminal, psychotic, and or violent. The pulp element was still going strong in Psycho, but his new style from the stories he'd published in magazines was admittedly influenced by some of his favorite non-fantasy or supernatural authors, including James M. Cain. His earliest influences for these seminal novels leading up to his creation of Psycho include some of the titans in the mystery noir crime pulp fields. His setting for the scarf alone seems to foretell later associations with Hollywood, the movies, and major allusions to Raymond Chandler's Los Angeles. 
As even the primary setting of Block's later sequel to Psycho, Psycho 2, is Hollywood, it is obvious that his fascination with the place and the fact that his work would eventually find him relocating there permanently in the future was no accident. But while the scarf reads like a confessional story, Psycho is an effort at creating a true psychological mystery story that attempts to keep the reader shocked, scared, and guessing at the truth until almost the very end. Quote, I discovered, much to my surprise, and particularly if I was writing in the first person, that I could become a psychopath quite easily. I could think like one, and I could devise a manner of unfortunate occurrences, so I probably gave up a flourishing, lucrative career as a mass murderer." End quote. One cannot talk about the novel without mentioning the movie based on it. The book was purchased by blind agents for Alfred Hitchcock, having literally no idea who was purchasing his book. Block sold the film rights for something in the neighborhood of $2,000. Had the identity of the purchaser been revealed, Robert Block might have been entitled to a far grander sum, a wrong that would be done right after the release of the film. When Hitchcock acquired the rights to the novel, he reportedly had his longtime assistant Peggy Robertson buy up copies of the book to preserve the novel's surprises. While Outer Limits writer and producer Joseph Stefano penned the screenplay for the controversial motion picture, Hitchcock commented in print that Psycho was 90% Robert Block's book. Hitchcock would go on to state, Psycho all came from Robert Block's book. The scriptwriter, Joseph Stefano, a radio writer, he had been recommended by my agent's MCA, contributed dialogue mostly, no ideas. There is little doubt that Bloch's novel is very much the source for the film. Accordingly, much of the misattribution of the story, characters, and substance of the film over the years to people like screenwriter Joseph Stefano, Hitchcock himself, or others, is quite simply erroneous. Also, the novel contains much more substance in terms of background and plot than the film, especially where Norman's history and motivations are concerned. The backstory regarding Norman's having murdered his mother and her lover years before is the linchpin to understanding his later psychosis and split personality. As we know, a younger-looking Norman Bates, Anthony Perkins, was cast in the movie version, and Block wholeheartedly agreed with Hitchcock on his selection as the older, less attractive man described in the book would immediately be the suspected villain in the film. As already mentioned in the book, Norman is an overweight, balding man who has a fear of women. He is shy but is always on edge, and when he is alone, he becomes very vulgar. It is easier to clue in that the Norman in the book was the one more capable of the killing, but not so much the Norman in the movie, which works in favor of the surprise twist ending. Mary Crane's name was changed to Marion in the movie. The reason for this is that production found that there were two people named Mary Crane in Phoenix, Arizona, and to avoid a lawsuit, they changed the name. Although the movie is great in its own right, the main failings of the film stem from Hitchcock's lack of interest and motivation. For example, the fact that Marion's theft is a revenge on a man who has offered her money for sex is omitted from the film thereby losing the key point that her crime is driven by emotional forces, not by rational self-interest. Nevertheless, the success of the movie is undeniable and has earned its praise and place in cinema history. Any ill feelings toward Hitchcock were washed away by the muddy waters of success and the opportunity to write stories for the director's popular television series, Alfred Hitchcock Presents. And thus, Block became one of the program's most prolific writers, contributing some 17 teleplays, including The Greatest Monster of Them All, 1961, The Sorcerer's Apprentice, 1962, and The Sign of Satan, 1964, guest starring Christopher Lee. And when concerning his writing routine, Block kept it simple. Quote, I sit down at 9 o'clock and will write until I notice that the wastebasket is full of popcorn balls. 
I know that if I crumple up enough sheets of paper, I must be getting tired and I better quit for the day and return to it when I'm fresh. And so the schedule generally runs from 9 to about 1. I do try to keep a regular schedule, 5 days a week. I feel that writing is a habit and it must be enforced by self-discipline. This is why so many people whom I've known, who are brilliant, who have fine minds, who have great creative talent, have never made it as writers because they don't have that self-discipline. They are not able to force themselves to do something that is less agreeable than going out and enjoying themselves and living it up a little. I've always felt that people who have had an easy time in actual life are less prone to do anything in the creative arts because they have less need to. In his personal life, despite his public persona, Robert Block was a quiet, gentle man with a robust, self-effacing sense of humor and a love of the arts. Cancer consumed his sensitive soul in 1994 at age 77, but not before he went on to inspire numerous other writers, including sending a letter of motivation to Ray Bradbury and being the mentor of Dallas Mayer, better known as Jack Ketchum, who you might just hear about rather soon. As usual, I will leave you with a final quote from the horror meister himself. I urge you with all sincerity to get to work. Write a book, write two, three, four books, just as a matter of course. Don't worry about wasting an idea or spoiling a plot by going too fast. If you are capable of turning out a masterpiece, you'll get other and even better ideas in the future. Right now, your job is to write and to write books so that by so doing, you'll gain the experience to write still better books later on." End quote. Thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and will spread the word about the podcast. Once again, I have been your host, Jason and Moore Harden. We at House of Words ask that you please consider helping to make this show easier to produce and more frequent by contributing on our Patreon page at patreon.com slash houseofwords or paypal.me slash houseofwordspodcast. Alternatively, you can head over to subscribe and encourage others to subscribe to our YouTube page, House of Words Podcast. Every little bit helps more than you might think. And with that, we wish you a happy Halloween. Boom. Until next time, keep turning those pages. House of Words is written and produced by Crystal M. Sanchez. Narrated and written by me, Jason and Moore Harden. And music by Creature9 and Wood. All rights and ownership belong to Crystal M. Sanchez and Jason Lemore Harden.